Yeah, it's going to be a huge disappointment because there really isn't all that much of action in the entire talk, but maybe it's going to be, gonna be good anyhow. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the, the evolutionary function of conscious information processing and how it's revealed, that's funny, how it's revealed by its task dependency in all faction. But in reality, I don't have any data and I'm only going to answer that question in the last minute. And most of the time I'm going to talk about the question and how we should ask that question and how we should think about function in those kind of situations. And once I'm done with that, you will realize how boring and obvious the answer to the question is and not even care about when I give it to you at the end. Um, and so the, the, you, may, you may wonder who gave me the authority to tell you how to think about function and what questions to ask, right? So um, I'm taking the approach that we look at other more mature fields of research and see how people talk about function in those fields and then argue that consciousness research should think about it in the same way. So it can be seen, the whole talk can be seen as a polemic against the exceptionalism for consciousness research. Okay, let's just get in. So first function, what should, what should we require from something to be a function? We had all those talks about what non-conscious processes can do, and then it was always implied or explicitly said that that means what is the function of consciousness when the non-conscious processes can do so many things. So in one talk, the, the metaphor was the island of possibilities of what the function of conscious processes is, and that island gets smaller and smaller the more we discover what non-conscious processes do. But I think that's the wrong way to think about function. The lack of alternative is not required for something to be a function of something. If you think about this fish, this fish, the fins of the fish, function of those fins are probably swimming or steering during swimming or something that has to do with aquatic locomotion. But of course, many other animals can also swim without having those fins. So no self-respecting fish scientist would conclude from that that it can't be the function of the fins to swim or steer during swimming. So lack of alternatives is just not outside of consciousness research. Anything required for function you just think about, um, you know, the function of the chairs to sit on. We can sit many other places, which is irrelevant to determine what the function of the chair is. So lack of alternative has nothing to do with what the function of conscious processes would be. This is more eloquently and in more detail pointed out by Fred Tretzky here too. Um, so it's not really, it's not function, it's about evolutionary function, and that's, I think, where this idea comes from, that there has to be no alternative for it, because if you think about it, there was like one creature that was the first ever creature to be capable of conscious processes, and that creature must have had an adaptive advantage over its siblings and ancestors and other creatures, because only then natural election could act on that, and the um, the trait of being able to consciously process things would have spread through the population and through the species. And obviously that's what happened. So people may, based on that, think, you know, like it must have a function, it must have been able to do something. Those people were capable of reasoning or whatever it is that the other people were not, which conveyed that adaptive advantage. So. If you think about function in evolutionary context, it's no longer the lack of alternative, but it's the novelty. It has to be something new. Otherwise, there's nothing for um, natural selection to act on. That's the thinking. But that's a too naive thinking, and it's not true. So it's not necessary for something to be an evolutionary function to be a novel function. Of course, it's often the case if you think about wings, you know, like, you get wings and then you can fly and before you couldn't fly, so it's a new function that those wings do. And those are the standard cases you will see in um, natural geographic documentaries, but it's not necessarily the case. 
because evolution doesn't care about novelty. What evolution cares about is efficiency. So if you have a system that does, does, does something more efficient than the old system, even if it's the same thing, then that will spread like wildfire through the population and take over. So it doesn't need to be capable to do something new or something interesting or something that changes behavior. As long as it does something more efficiently, that's completely fine. And if you look at the um, at evolution at a more molecular level, that's actually the main driving force behind evolution. Things just become more efficient and it's not so much that new stuff gets invented. So if you believe that, um, then it's not required for the function of conscious processes that it's novel or there are no alternatives. It could be anything. It could be storing information in memory. Clearly, you can do it non-consciously, but let's say non-consciously, it costs you 100 calories to store a gigabyte, and consciously, it costs you only 50 calories. That will be a huge adaptive advantage, and the conscious version of it will spread and take over, and then we end up doing it consciously. So this is the kind of idea behind those things. If you don't want to think in terms of energy, you can think of it in terms of brain size or neurons required. If you can do something consciously with a smaller brain, then you would be able to do it non-consciously, then there would be a huge advantage of not having to build and maintain such a large brain. So this is my first conclusion. If, when we talk about function in consciousness research, we are supposed to talk about the same thing as researchers talk elsewhere, and we can't have novelty or lack of alternatives as a requirement. I, I you know, dare you to go to a cell biology conference where somebody gives a talk and says, I discovered the function of that protein. It's a kinase that phosphorylates other proteins. And then you ask a question saying that can't be the function. This other kinase also phosphorylates proteins. So, you know, we require that there's no, no alternative way of doing it. And this is a new way. So this is just outside of, of our community. People don't think about evolutionary functions in that way at all. And so my argument is we shouldn't either. Okay, moving on to the, to the second second phrase here, conscious information processing. When I presented um, a draft of, of some writing of that, I got the suggestion to like just make it consciousness instead that's, you know, snappier and it doesn't bring in all those information processing assumptions. And it's what people talk about, the function of consciousness. But of course, it's not just like a different way of wording, but it's a completely different type of questions if you ask the function of, excuse me, consciousness or conscious processes in the brain. So these are the two possible functions, function of conscious processes or function of the neural processes property being conscious or function of consciousness. And I'm gonna argue that the above question is a good one and the below one is a bad one. And I'm gonna do that by using an example from hematology, the study of blood. So you can either ask what's the function of red blood cells or you can ask what's the function of the blood cells property being red. What's the function of the redness? And this is a nice example because there's nothing mysterious about blood cells. We know everything there is to know about blood cells. So if you go and actually ask a hematologist those questions, if you ask her what's the function of red blood cells, She's going to say, like, well, they distribute oxygen from the lungs to other tissues in the body. If you ask her what's the function of it being red, she's going to be saying something like, um, well, you know, they're red because there's this hemoglobin that has this iron, and that's necessary to bind to the oxygen. And what those cells do is transport that oxygen through the body. So she can't answer that question with a, this is the function. She's going to explain why those cells have that property by referring to the function of those cells. So this could be like the most mysterious question in hematology, what's the function of the redness? But the mystery doesn't come from anything interesting. It comes from asking a question about a property that can't probably be dissociated from the cell. 
So I say this here again. It's a bad question because neither conceptually nor experimentally it's possible to isolate the redness. The redness is because the hemoglobin and iron have a certain structure that reflects light in a certain way. If you want to change the redness, you have to change that structure. But that structure is also what makes it bind to oxygen. So as you change the color, you change the binding, binding to oxygen. You can't think about um, red blood cells that aren't red, but otherwise the same. And the same is true for consciousness. So this is a bad question for the same reasons. And the good question is to think about the function of conscious information processing or conscious brain activities or conscious processes. The information processing doesn't really play that important a role here. Okay, so that's my conclusion too. If you ask what is the function of consciousness, you make the assumption that dualism is true because what you're asking somebody is to imagine a brain with all it's going on and then the same brain with all it's going on being identical but on top of that consciousness. And then you ask people to think about what can one do that the other can't do. But you can only think about that when you already are a dualist who believes that it's possible to think about those things. Um, for the other function, there's much less um, wrong assumptions or less speculative assumption. All you need is that there's an answer to the pretty hard problem as, as Dave Charnas called it. So you just need some processes that in a rule-like manner correlate with consciousness. And then you can say, okay, so these are the conscious processes. So what are they doing for the organism? So that's the question you should ask. You should ask about the function of the mechanism or the function of the structure, but you shouldn't ask about the function of a property because the property can't be dissociated from the mechanism or structure um, in any way. Okay, so I spent 12 minutes talking about the question. That's three minutes for the answer. Um, so what's the method, the, the regular method, method for finding evolutionary function? It's contrastive analysis. So you want to find as many instances of it as possible and see what does it do. So there's no, because evolutionary function is a, you know, a, a historical concept um, depending on what happened in evolution. So you can't do a lab experiment that will answer that question. And you can't have a counter example that will disprove it. The way to do it, as with all questions in evolution, is to look at as many possible instances you have and then from all those instances, try to distill what the function of it is. That's how it's done for wings, for example. So let's say the function of wings is flight. But then there's the ostrich, which has wings and doesn't fly. And then there are other birds, like this bird of paradise, which has wings but uses them for courtship display. Or the swan uses it to protect and transport the children. So once something evolved, it can be used for all kinds of different things, or it can evolve further and no longer be used for what it evolved for. So there's no, there's not going to be a rule or, as I said, an experiment to test that. You just have to look at all the evidence and come up with the theory that is most consistent about that. Okay, so what's about this path dependency in that question? Well, I guess that's part of the answer to the question implied by that title. So smell is a nice model system for consciousness research because we are by default not conscious of it, right? So every, almost every moment, there are enough molecules in the air you inhale into your nose so that they activate your sensory neurons and something goes on in your brain and they, you know, mediate your behavior. You're more likely to stay in a room longer that doesn't smell bad, even if there's no conscious processing of it. So you have a very nice default, non-conscious um, behavioral guidance by smells. And then only sometimes in rare instances do you need actually to like kick it up and start processing that very same information consciously. And it's a nice contrastive case because it can be the exact same stimulus and it can be the exact same state of the perceiver the only difference is the task you're faced with. And so the 
some result from thinking about this is it depends on how many behavioral options there are. If you just have to spit something out or swallow it, or if you just have to fight with somebody or have sex with them, if you have very few options that are there for you, then you don't need to process it consciously. When you want to mix a perfume or when you want to write a review about a wine or any other thing where you have a huge variety of different um, possible behavioral options, then conscious processing is required. So the complexity of the task is what determines if it's needed to process these olfactory um, inputs consciously or not. And you have a huge literature in the um, animal models in, the, in rodents where you see that the processing, the very, very early perceptual processing of olfaction is task dependent. So depending on what you train the mouse to do, if it's a simple task, it's a very different type of processing than a complicated. So that would be, you know, discovering what that difference is would be the difference between a conscious and non-conscious processing. And then you can up with the idea of how there's a different strategy that's the most efficient one to respond in those simple choices and another strategy that's the most efficient one in those complicated choices. So that ties back into what I said about how it evolved. It didn't evolve because it could do something new, but there was a subset of tasks that an animal has to do that could more um, efficiently be done when it's consciously perceived. So that's my third and last conclusion, the evolutionary function of conscious information processing is decision-making in situations in which there are many pertinent behavioral options. So this can also be, you know, quantified and um, I think it's a very testable hypothesis. Um, okay, that's all I got. I want to thank, I have dual affiliations. I'm a um, I'm a neuroscientist at the Rockefeller University where my boss is Leslie Fossil, but I'm also writing a, I'm at the philosophy department at CUNY where Jesse Prince is my advisor. So I thank those two people and everybody here for listening to me. Thank you. Right, so you could say that the function is efficient decision making, right? Yeah. Is that, would that make a big difference or would that make a dualistic? Blah, blah, blah. I don't see that because it's not the function of consciousness but of the information processing. So it's like the function of that mechanism is to make those decisions. So I don't hope that there's no dualism getting in there. Hello. So today I would like to talk about the relationship between action and perceptual decision. So perceptual decision making is a decision based on a certain uh, feature of the sensitive stimulus. But, uh, to, but to express that decision, uh, the, way to, the way to express that decision may differ between choices to choices. For example, for example, if you're in an orchard, your aim may be to pick up the most reddish apple from the tree. But one of the apple may be in a reachable place. Another apple is high up on the tree that you have to climb up to get it. So the effort required to express that decision may differ between choice to choice. So, so in Aesop's fables, the fox would regard this kind of situation requiring a, a lot of effort, saying the fruit will be not ripe and should be sour. 
the question here is, is the fox lying and making excuse not to pay effort for the fruit? Or is the fox really perceiving the fruit as is not ripe? So I made, we made two questions. The first question is, is the cost to act integrated with the perceptual decision making process? And as you have heard many times in this conference, the, the substantial difference between conscious, uh, being conscious and being unconscious. Pardon? So another question we had was, does it matter whether you know there is cost to perform a decision or not? We made a very simple paradigm Very simple we made a very simple paradigm where uh, the, the, it's a random dot motion judgment task, so we had to judge whether the random dot is moving to the right or to the left. And to express that decision, the, the subjects were holding two manipulandums, robotic manipulandums, one in each hand, and when they thought the dots, the majority of dots are moving to the right, they moved the right manipulandum and made a reaching movement. And also when they think it was moving to the left, they made a left reaching movement. Because it's a robotic device, we can control the amount of uh, force required to move that handle. So in the first experiment, what we did was in the, in the, baseline, in the baseline condition, uh, the resistance of the, uh, or the required force uh, to move the handle was equalized between both hands. But after the baseline condition, we slowly, slowly increase the force or resistance of the movement of the left hand. So because we made it uh, increase slowly, slowly, uh, trial by trial, at the end, subjects were making twice as much as force compared to the right hand for the left hand, but they don't really realize that there was, the heaviness has changed. But in experiment two, what we did was after the baseline condition, we immediately ramped up uh, the force required to move the left hand. So the participants in UK is quite talkative. So after the baseline condition, they usually immediately stop and say to me that something is wrong in your program and the left hand is heavier. But that's not the case. We have to, I have to keep telling them to continue. So in the experiment one, it's an implicit case. In the experiment two, it's an explicit case. So this is, this is a, a Baseline, a result of the baseline condition of the experiment one, the vertical axis is the probability of judging the, the right, with, right, judging the stimulus as right of motion, and the horizontal bar is uh, the motion coherence level. The positive is the rightward, negative is the leftwards. You can clearly see that the uh, psychometric function and the PSC, the, the most uncertain point, was around the 0% coherence level. So basically this is saying that subjects are making their decision, classifying the motion based on the uncertainty of the stimulus. So this was same for the experiment two also. So because effectively baseline condition, for the baseline condition, experiment one, experiment two is completely same. But after exposed the cost in experiment one, you can clearly see that the psychometric function shifted towards the left side, indicating that subjects start to avoid uh, making a leftward judgment. But in experiment two, when they realized, clearly realized about the increased effort for the hand, there was, we, we did not observe any significant shift. So for answering the first two questions we raised, is the cost to act integrated with the perceptual decision making process? It seems as though, yes, uh, it biases the per perceptual decision making, the decision boundary towards the direction to avoid the cost. For the second question, does it matter if you know there is a cost in one of the actions? And, and the answer seems to be also yes. It biases the decision only when the cost is implicit to the participants. So we will now focus on this uh, uh, effect of action on perception in this implicit case because there was a bias. So, so we wanted to know at what level in the sensory motor pipeline is this bias represented? So if I, if I say it in other words, is it really biasing the sensory or perceptual component of the decision making? So what I mean is there's two, there could be two possibilities. One is a bias at the stage of effective selection. So the sensory information is coming in, 
and then that is transmitted to the motor effector. Because there is a, a symmetry in amount of effort at the motor effector level, maybe nothing is changing at the sensory representation level, but at the stage of, of selecting the effector, that bias is kicking in. So if that is the case, if we change the effector after exposing the cost, there should be no bias observed. So if this is the case, we may not be able to say that action cost has changed some kind of a sensory or perceptual component. So another possibility is, as, is that the bias is happening at the state upstream to the effector selection. So bias, uh, action, uh, asymmetry in, in the required effort at the motor effector level may have been transferred to the sensory representation side and then there was a bias at the sensory representation. So if that is the case, the, the effect should be transferred to a different effector, even if the subject does do the judgment using a different effector, such kind of bias should be observed. So if this is the case, we may be able to say that maybe it's, it's a perceptual change. So we, plan, we run uh, experiment three, which the, 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 the procedure is almost more or less similar to experiment one. We have a baseline condition, slowly ramping up the effort for the left hand, and, 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 to, and we have a baseline condition and test condition. The difference is, during the baseline condition and the test condition, we, in, we, we have a couple of uh, non-action tasks. Okay. So non-action task is subject to ask not to move, and then we present some kind of a near threshold level stimulus, which is either going to the left or going to the right. But subject, uh, sorry, either going to the left or there's a completely random. So subject judgment was to judge whether there is a coherent motion or not. So it's, and they vocally answered by voice saying yes or no. So this is a result of the action task. We replicated the result of the experiment one. When subject uh, exposed the implicit cost, they start to shift the psychometric function and started to avoid making leftward judgments. And this is the result of the non-action tasks. So, so we're presenting, so we analyze the data in the signal detection paradigm and uh, we, we present D prime and the criterion. You can see that for the D prime, so this is, we're presenting the difference between the baseline condition and the test condition. So for the D prime, we don't have a significant difference between the left and right, slightly high, uh, uh, increased D prime for right, but there's no significant difference. But for the criterion, we found that for the leftward motion, subject become more conservative uh, compared to the right and compared to the baseline condition. So it seems that action cost is biasing, not at the stage of the motor apparatus, but at the stage somewhere in the sensory representation. The final question is, at which stage of the sensory processing is biased? So there could be two possibilities. One is the encoding, encoding uh, situation, uh, encoding layer or the reading out process. So, so now we focus on only in the sensory side. But there could be top two possibilities. Encoding layer, suppose that the, the amount of firing induced by a certain direction of the video stimulus may have been changed. So that will change the, the how, you, how the subject responds to the stimulus. Another possibility is that the firing of, 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 the, the, of the firing of the neurons to the visual stimulus is not really changing, but how the brain classifies that firing to the left or the right is changing. So the, the, the layer for the reading out is changing. So to untangle these two possibilities, we decided to use diff drift diffusion model. So in the framework of drift diffusion model, it is regarded that the decision making is, is, is a, a evidence accumulation process. And then when the evidence is accumulated to a certain decision bound, in this case to the right decision bound, then the decision is made. So for, from the onset of the stimulus to the decision is called, uh, we is assumed as called decision time. And then there is a, a, some, some additional time which required to, to express the decision, which we call it non-decision time. So the sum of the decision time and the non-decision time is, can be regarded as the reaction time. So as I said, there could be two possibilities. One is, one is uh, 
having a more having a more firing for, for the right word motion. So in this framework, that can be regarded as adding more sensory input to one direction. So it's gonna be, it will be like increased evidence accumulation rate for one of the direction and decreasing for the other. So if this is the case, this is, we, we can simulate the data and we can find a clear bias in the choice. And at the same time, the simulated reaction time would be like this. The, the uncertainty point shifts slightly to the leftward direction. So this is, this is a situation of changing the encoding. So another possibility is biasing the readout of the sensor input, which is by changing the starting point of the accumulation process. So this will make the, the suppose in this case, this will make the right word decision to be, become more frequent because the distance is more smaller compared to the other. And again, we can find, uh, if we can simulate that there is a strong choice bias. But at the same time, the reaction time profile will be quite different to the previous. So uh, this will make the reaction time for the leftward motion more, more slow, rightward motion more fast, but there's no shift. So we have obtained this result from the experiment one and, two, one and three. So we want, by looking at the reaction time, we want to know whether this is this is due to uh, some additional signal or like shifting the baseline, of start, shifting the starting value. So we, we fitted the model. So I won't go into detail, but uh, two important parameters here is the additional coherence level, which is, can be transformed into uh, additional uh, firing rate. And also another parameter is a change in the starting value. So, so we made a couple of models, including, including the, the coherence level change, the starting value change, changing both. And we found that the, the model with starting value change explains the data best. And, uh, and we can reconstruct the choice data and the reaction time profile. So by using this, uh, by using this uh, uh, so reconstructed choice data, we can calculate the TSE from this data and we can find a clear correlation between the previous data. So the model is doing well. And then if we look into the parameters of the starting value, we can clearly find that starting value is significantly shifting compared to the baseline. So this means that the action cost is biasing at the stage of the reading out layer. Okay, in summary, so, we found that uh, when we found that uh, this implicit, implicitly uh, giving an action action cost changes how we interpret the visual information, and we don't know why it is. But but what we are speculating is that there is a conflict between the sensor input. Sensor input is suppose the visual motion is moving to the left, but as a system you want to avoid the cost. Okay, so there is a conflict. So maybe if you know that there is a cost that knowledge about knowing it may explain away why there is a conflict. So you don't have to really rely on the conflict. But when, when you're not aware of it, maybe the brain mixes and, and overrides the sensory information by the cost. But this is just a speculation. And we found that there's this uh, motor effort changing the reading out layer. And so what we want to say is the output of the perceptual decision depends not only on the feature of the sensory stimulus, but on the whole sensory motor process involved in the decision. So coming to the conclusion, for, for this Fox's case, we may be able to say that Fox may be not confabulating, or, or at least he's not realizing that he's not confabulating, he's, he's confabulating. So my advisors, Patrick Haggard and Joran Dietrichen. Thank you very much. said that uh, the effect is at the sensory level. Uh, if I remember well, uh, so the subject had for some trials to make a movement, but for others not to make a movement. So could their decision be based not on the fact that they are biased at the sensory level, 
but by their own previous decision. Since they were biased by the force and they made more rightward movements and leftward movements, and they, this is maybe what uh, makes them choose more the right than the left, and not because that's biased at a sensory level. Well, that could, that could be possible, but, but uh, the important thing is the task is different. So, so for, for the action task, it's de deciding left or right. But in the non-action task, it's saying yes or no, so whether there is a coherent motion or not. So it can't be, because suppose you were saying lot, a lot of right, 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 right in the, the action situation, it can't directly transfer to the situation of non-action task because it's a yes and no task. No, but it could be that I've seen a lot of uh, left movement where I actually responded right, so I must be consistent and say it was right even if at the sensory level I saw left. I mean, just something that uh, they will try to be consistent across the trials. So it will be an effect of the previous trials on the decision making rather at the sensory level. Maybe I'm not really understanding. So, so the task is different. So, so the, at least it's not like an like a inertia of, of just, just judging right or left, okay? That's just one thing. And another thing is to maintain the consistency be between the previous action trials and the perceptual judgments. I don't know, it may, may be possible, but, but, but I, don't know, I don't have a straightforward answer for that. But, but Thanks. We can talk together later. Um, so, uh, did you actually interleave the trials with the action, with the manipulandum? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, it's interleaved, yeah. So, like 10 trials, 10 trials, 10 trials. So, they kind of pop up. So uh, did, did you actually check whether you would have the same effect when, when you really just have the perceptual task? And right. did, did you check uh, whether the subject would still have the... Uh, no, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, then you could not... Then so it so would not be clear so what the that, that question is very important, but it's, that is actually checking how long it lasts. Yeah, yeah, I know, so there would be not the effect. Okay, I was sort of expecting that you take an eye movement instead of the perceptual judgment, mm -hmm. just to see whether it's specific. Did you check it and it looked like the no, same the as the, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no, because what, 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 what would be the difference between change? Uh, well, in one case you would or still or have. Or, or we change it vocally, we change it to vocal. Because it would be still motor, a directed motor response versus a sort of a non-directed mm -hmm. motor response or perceptual judgment. So like in neglect patients, for example, it's, it's a huge, uh, like you, you can really have different effects depending on whether it's a directed motor response mm -hmm. or not. So in both cases, you would have a directed motor response, mm -hmm. but, um, but it would be one effect that would have effort really manipulation, the other one wouldn't, but it's, yeah, I was just, yeah. okay, cool. Um, so then the next talk will be um, on fly control, or actually the question how whether a fly um, knows when it's in control. And the talk is delivered by Leonie Kirsenblatt from the Queensland University, just in this room. Thanks to the program organisers for giving me this opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm sorry, I actually changed my title, but hopefully I'll get a bit closer to the original question towards the end of the talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about how we can study attention in flies and hopefully um, convince you that flies can also pay attention. So why would we want to study attention in a fly? It has a completely different brain to us. Um, if you just look at the structure of the fly brain, it doesn't resemble the human brain much at all. Um, in terms of, of size as well, um, a fly brain is much smaller and simpler. It only contains 100,000 neurons. Um, but it's interesting if you consider that such a simple brain can still have such complex behaviours. So flies um, still have learning, memory, um, and attention. So, sorry, too loud. Okay. Um, okay. So um, there are many ways you can study. Okay. 
Okay. Um, there are many ways that you can study attention in humans um, that become more difficult and more challenging when you, you look at flies. So flies obviously can't tell you what they're seeing or perceiving. Um, also flies cannot move their eyes, um, so you can't really look at their direction of gaze. Um, and in, in humans, um, there are many different measures of brain activity, as you know, um, EEG, fMRI, many different ways that you can't exactly um, apply to a fly which has such a small brain. So yeah, I hope to um, sort of tell you a little bit more about how we can try and address um, the, or measure this um, brain activity and behavior in flies. Um, so a really um, simple and old paradigm for uh, looking at um, what a fly is paying attention to is um, this paradigm called Berman's paradigm, invented by Carl Goetz in 1980. Um, it's, it basically involves clipping a fly's wings, so it's walking on a platform um, in the center of an arena, and you can then start to, you can place visual objects around it, and even though the fly can't move its eyes, you can see what it, it's looking at by the um, direction of its walking, or um, orienting, and this is called fixation. Um, and so we built this um, paradigm in our lab. It's a bit of a modified version um, where you have a hexagon of LED panels. And the advantage of these is that they have a very high refresh rate and we can um, present more different types of stimuli um, on it and have much more control over their visual environment. So this is just a video to show you what it looks like um, when a fly sort of fixates on these two stripes. Um, it looks like a very reflexive behavior in some ways because it will keep doing this going back and forth for hours and hours. Um, but it does, um, it will actually remember where these stripes are. It has a memory for the spatial location. So it, is, it does seem to have elements of attention and uh, working memory involved in this. Um, to just give you an idea of the behavior, so this is what it looks like when a fly is just randomly um, walking around with no visual stimuli in its environment. Um, when you place um, two stationary stripes on either side, you get this pretty robust fixation behavior. Um, we can also make things more salient to the fly. For example, um, flashing the stimuli um, will attract them a lot more. And then to get closer to visual attention paradigms, we can add distractors and, and see how much um, the fly's attention is drawn away from um, the flickering targets. Uh, the advantage of this paradigm is that it's high throughput, so you can get through you know, 100 flies a day, and this allows you to screen for mutants and things like that. But um, the disadvantage is that you can't perform the electrophysiology um, because it's freely walking. So this is where um, another paradigm comes in handy, which we have in the lab, which is where the fly is um, tethered, so it's fixed in place. Uh, it walks on an air-supported ball in the center of an arena. Uh, and it's got, um, you can, it can actually control its visual environment um, through its movements on the ball, much like a joystick on a computer, um, because we have a camera that videos the, um, records the movements, or I'll just start these videos, of the fly on the ball, um, and then uh, this software can um, detect the rotation of the ball, and through that it can then feed back into the um, arena to change the bar position. So that such that the fly can control the bar in closed loop, much like I can control this mouse on the screen. And um, if you look at this behavior across flies, um, they, you can see that they like to keep the bar in front of them, so they really hold it in front for most of the time. And the advantage of this paradigm, as I mentioned, is that we can record from the brain at the same time as it's behaving. Uh, and this is a technique that was developed by a postdoc in the lab, Angelique Polk. Um, so just to give you an idea of the fly brain, it's pretty um, symmetrical, which means that um, we can just place an electrode that goes right through from one eye um, to the other. And um, we can record from these 16 sites on the electrode. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the data set we collected recently from 24 flies, you can see uh, all the electrode sites that map onto the fly brain and we can locate, uh, we can use mapping to locate the regions of the brain um, where the electrodes are recording from. Uh, so uh, in humans, uh, you can use um, frequency tagging, as you, you've all heard, I mean, a lot at this conference, um, to, to sort of understand attention, what a person is paying attention to. So when a person visualizes a flickering stimulus, you can see that um, resonate in the oscillations in the brain, and this is enhanced when the person is paying attention to the stimulus. 
Um, so we can also try and tackle this in the fly um, by using, by uh, making the bar flicker at, at a, a frequency that is salient to the fly. So seven hertz is a very salient frequency. So the fly can fixate on it and then we can record um, the steady state visual evoke potentials in the brain. Um, so this is um, just a, a, our data set again where we've just coloured um, the locations of where um, the electrodes are sitting in the brain. So you have le uh, red on the left um, and blue on the right. Um, and then we can align the, um, the brain activity to the behaviour. So um, here you can see the, um, this is the behavior, the bar position of the fly. So in the pink, this is when um, the fly, the bar is being held in front of the fly over time. And you can see when the bar is on the, more on the left side of the fly, you can see um, the seven hertz uh, response more in the left eye. And then when the fly brings it to the right hand side, you can see the flicker response more in the right hand side of the eye. And then um, we can map this, um, to, so we can look at the, where the bar position is and map the SSVP strength um, from the Mollet wavelet coefficient am amplitude onto um, this polar plot. So you can see here that uh, the SSVP is stronger in the left eye when the bar is in the left and stronger in the right eye when the bar is on the right. Whereas for a central brain electrode, it's um, a lot more frontal. So this gives you an idea of, of um, sort of receptive fields for these for the SSVP from the, in the different brain regions. Um, and then we can just do this for all the different electrode sites that we're recording from. So basically a conclusion that we can say so far is that the SSVP strength depends on the visual stimulus position um, and the brain region. Um, but uh, at the same time, we're also recording the behavior of the fly, its movement on the ball. Um, so this is the fly with the, you can see the electrode in its head as it's walking on the ball here. And this is just one, this is pretty new data, so we're just looking at different ways to visualize it. And this is one way um, we can look at it. So uh, you can see here on the y-axis, we have the walking speed, and on the x-axis, we have the turning rate. So um, this is when the fly is rightward turning and when the fly is leftward turning. And if you just uh, ignore the colors for a minute, you can notice that um, when the fly is walking very fast, it's not turning very much, which, which makes sense because it doesn't want to turn corners fast, just like when you're driving a car. But on the other hand, um, if you look at the colors, um, so this is representing the SSVP strength now mapped onto the behavior at each point in time in the experiment across all these flies, you can see that um, it's stronger when the fly is walking forward at a moderate speed and we're st still not sure whether this might represent a different behavioral state that the fly is in or um, whether it might also be to do with um, whether it's fixating on the bar more um, during this time. Um, so this is kind of getting back to original question. Um, does what happen, so the whole time long when um, with this data set the fly is in control of the bar so it's in closed loop but what happens if we just if the fly isn't in control and can we see a difference in the behavior and the brain activity. Uh, so uh, we did an experiment where we, we basically let the flies control the bar in closed loop. So this is just the bar position over time and in, in an example fly. And then what we did was open the loop so, and presented exactly the same stimulus to the fly so that it, could, it was still behaving on the ball but it couldn't control the stimulus. So um, we called this the replay uh, condition. Um, and I'm just showing you, so this is the same data as I showed you before when the fly was in controlling the bar in closed loop. Um, and surprisingly, if you just visualize the data this way, you don't really see any difference. So maybe the fly doesn't know when it's in control. If we just look at it this way, it, it could be um, exactly the same as if it's seeing this, uh, if it's, as if it's not in control of the stimulus. So, um, we did, because we still had um, the multiple electrocytes, we still, we could actually look at this a bit more closely in the different brain regions. Um, and so uh, we looked at um, the optic lobes and also um, the central brain um, for these two different conditions, closed loop and replay. Um, and what we saw was that in, if you just look at the optic lobes, you can't really see much of a difference in these brain activity uh, behavior profiles. But if you look at the central brain, it does look like there might be a, a stronger SSVP um, response when the fly is in control 
um, versus when it's, um, it's not in control of the bar, um, which we still have to analyze further, but would be interesting um, considering that the central brain is much more uh, involved in higher order cognition and motor control than um, the, the optic lobes. So I'm just going to end on some questions uh, for my, at the end of my talk. So I don't think we've really answered this question. Does a fly know um, when it's controlled? But hopefully, I mean, we're pretty open to suggestions of different ways we could um, sort of try to address this question. Um, another question that comes up out of curiosity, can we create brain computer interfaces with a fly? Um, so we can get the fly to control something um, using its behavior, but could we actually get it to control something through its brain activity? Uh, and, and finally, is a fly conscious? So we've seen a lot of ways to, to measure consciousness uh, in this conference. Um, so it depends how you want to define it or measure it. But um, one way that um, we can start to look at it is, um, for example, using uh, Julio's uh, measure of fly. So um, now Tsuchiya and a PhD student in his lab, uh, Draw Cohen, are now sort of using um, this kind of data to look at whether or not we can actually get sort of a quantitative measure of, of how conscious a fly is. Um, so I'd just like to finish there and acknowledge my supervisor, Bruno Van Swinderen, uh, and Angelique Pork, who developed this technique, and um, Yang Chung, who um, helped me perform the experiments. Thank you. started out by saying why the fly, but then everything you told us could have been done in every other insect too. And the real reason people use flies is the genetics that we can use there. So are you planning any genetic screens for attention reasons or things along those lines? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we, this was really like the first time we'd ever sort of put together So given the size of the fly brain, I think the, the, the size of the region caused by the electrode is kind of, kind of significant compared to when you stick the same thing in, uh, say, rodent brain or uh, monkey brain. So is there any, um, so do, do you consider the, the probability or possibility that um, the region caused by the electrode is uh, maybe too big, and then uh, that is really um, washing out all the possible um, yeah. outcomes. Yeah. You concluded by saying that um, 
Maybe we could use a um, measure of consciousness to see uh, if a fly is conscious, but as we don't really know what consciousness is for humans, which type of measures uh, you are thinking about uh, for animals, because we don't know what type of consciousness, if they have one, to begin. something like that. 
So an example of this is Stereopsis. Um, and in Stereopsis, you have two types. You've got your absolute disparity and your relative disparity. Now, I'm only just learning this stuff, but this, what it seems to me is, so let's say we've got A here is where you're focusing on. There doesn't need to be any object here. In absolute disparity, you might just be looking off into the distance. And then you've got an object over here, B, which is uh, something in your visual field. Now, in absolute disparity, how this, this is used, by the way, for telling the distance of something. This is one of the cues that we can use for telling distance, stereoscopic difference. Absolute disparity just takes uh, the, the distance from the fovea that the, the information uh, reaches in the eye. The distance from the fovea, it, it subtracts the two angles away and you get your absolute disparity here. Now the interesting thing about that is uh, that, see I have a description of it here, yeah, okay, so the difference is the angular difference from the fovea in the two eyes. Now, that gives you a sort of eye-centric coordinate, and that information seems to be used for uh, driving quite low-level things. It seems to go near the lips of things all the time, like directing your eye to certain things, or also certain things to do with gravity. Now, we also have relative disparity, which is basically when there's two objects. So now A and B are both objects, and we have a representation of the difference between the two of them, or the distance between the two of them. Um, and that's done by taking the absolute disparity of both uh, and minusing them away from each other. And that gives you relative disparity. Now, the interesting thing about that is you've now lost uh, these eye-centric coordinates. And what you have is information about the distance, which is very good for representing sort of 3D, in, in a 3D field, the information about distance between objects. And it turns out, yeah, so that's just what's there. It turns out, so for the guidance of motor tasks, absolute disparity seems to drive the guidance of motor tasks. So you can have a change in relative disparity, and yet the subject will still grasp appropriately for it, or will still orient their eyes appropriately towards it. You can also, but it turns out with perception, it seems like relative disparity drives the subject's performance. So you can have a change in the absolute disparity, but so long as relative disparity is the same, subjects don't really notice the difference. So th this is an example of the sort of uh, what you would be able to overcome if you were to do what we would call simulation with difficult tasks. It's not the case that it's uh, a monolithic structure that you're operating on. It's two uh, interconnected algebraic frames that you're operating on multiple times. And you're talking about the object that you're trying to talk about and you're trying to keep in mind the things that you're trying to talk about. Now, this idea of simulation and this idea of sort of um, uh, talk about the same thing. And what I would say is a case study is that the problem of perception is not particularly complex. Um, there's no thing that's ideal. And there's no thing that the average of your perception is that seems to work for us. There's, there's only one thing that's not ideal. So one good one is about So size constancy is the ability to tell whether something's bigger or further. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs>
the alarm, we felt strongly about this and we didn't think that really goes to the objective of this and we're going to do some other things. We didn't think that was going to happen. And so when we're looking at the service area, we did not have a very robust project that we could provide to them. We could sort of drill beneath their deep seas here. So I can see that this is a little bit of a stretch for me to say that we need to do this. But uh, I just wanted to add a few things to that. And that can be a really, really good starting point. So it can begin to see Now, a lot of the work on ventilators is seen as a successful one, but one of the expensive ones is actually the work on compressor valves, which is the one we're seeing here. Um, but what our second point is on is pricing. And I, and I believe there is a way to do this. And I think there's a lot of work that I'm happy to talk about in a minute. But I'm just suggesting maybe, you know, just to level the room, it is important to go out and look at the data. It's not just the location of the ventilator. That argument is based on two dimensions, two different dimensions of the sensor. Um, is it going to process the work or is it not? Is it a process that takes a while or takes a day? We can look at all those different aspects of that. Um, instead, we see a major secure selling potential for the sensor in the past few years. We see a major increase in the cost of running it uh, in Thailand and beyond. And we see these different sensors being selected and things like that. So we see more sensors that have more of a value to the grid. Um, Thank you for staying here and to this last talk. And so I, already, I was already introduced, introduced and I'll be talking about the impact of fire expectations in subliminal behavior and like physiological response. Uh, should we talk closer? Can you hear me? Uh, the readiness potential has been known for quite a while now, and it was first found by Kornhuber and Dick in 64, and has been related, has been linked with lots of uh, unconscious processing. And for example, in his famous work, Libet in 1983, showed that the 
the subject while performing a voluntary uh, movement. They can move when they want. And they should tell where the dot in the circle was moving. I guess you all know this experiment. And he showed that way before the subject became conscious of his movement, the redness potential was already increasing like 500 milliseconds before. And so that's why it uh, has been linked with unconscious processing. Uh, oh, there's, there's something missing here. It's the LRP. Okay, I'm just going to talk about it. So another way to, another left physiological, left physiologic measure of unconscious processing is the LRP, as it was shown by Dehan in 1998, where he showed that in the, if the subject is performing a task of deciding if a number is bigger or smaller than five, and he should press larger than five for right hand and smaller left hand, but sometimes it had a subliminal cue before, then you can see this difference in the LRP. I cannot show you the difference between the two conditions because it's not working, but you have a lateralization, a difference in lateralization depending, depending on the congruent and incongruent trials. Although the subjects, they cannot see the cue, it tries the difference in the lateralization. And in a more recent work, the Lang and colleagues, they showed uh, that in a task where the subject is here is completely uh, conscious, superliminal, the subject is supposed to decide if the Brandon dots are moving to the right or to the left. But before they were giving a cue, saying that 8% of chance, in, chance going to the right, 8 to the left, or neutral. Uh, and they show that the lateralization starts way before the target. So here the queue arrives between uh, 800 and 1200 milliseconds before the target. And you can see that the lateralization starts uh, way before, the target's at zero, and it's uh, around the motor region, so it's the left topography. At the same time, if we compare the two bias conditions, right and left, with the neutral conditions, you have a main increase in activity in a more Fourier region. So putting all this literature together, we made a question, how can these expectations affect or bias the subliminal influence of, uh, of a subliminal stimulus? So we used a Posner-like paradigm where we create expectations about the incoming stimuli, and we said how these expectations interact with the motor decisions. And we measure how this expectation modulates the sensitivity and uh, on behavior and EEG response. I think I need to switch to the PDF because now I don't have the paradigm. So So this is the LRP that I discussed before. But I'm not going to this. So the Posner-like paradigm. It starts with the fixation cross. The other one I, I showed one per time, but this is an awesome time together, so it's a bit cluttered, so I'll explain what the mouse. So it starts with the fixation cross for a random duration between 250 milliseconds and 1500 milliseconds, and it's followed by a Q that's either neutral, fixed predicting the target at 50% right or left, right, predicting 75% right or left, doesn't matter. And it's followed by a random ISI between 50 milliseconds and 1500 milliseconds. So it's quite large ISI because we wanted to explore this region where the subject is making the lateralization and preparing to respond. So between this, after this random time, the subject received an arrow that's quite small here that was either above or below the fixation cross and lasts only 10 milliseconds and could be, of course, right or left. After the arrow, there was a blank screen for 10 milliseconds and 15% of the case, there was a mask that was a neutral mask to just to make a metaconscious mask with respect to the target and rendered the target subliminal in 50% of the case. So the subjects were instructed to answer as fast as possible to the 
with respect to the arrow. Yes. Um, not respond automatically to the queue, even though we didn't see the arrow. And so after 1,200 milliseconds, they received the warning saying you're too slow, and then they could blink for a while. And in the last three blocks, we changed the task, and we told them you can take as long as you want to answer, and we put the right, the letters R and L above and below, and there was counterbalance between trials, so they could choose the direction of the target with up and down arrows. So our prediction is that in the bias condition, in the bias when the, the Q is either R or L, after the Q, the subject will start to lateralize. So in the upper part, you can see the contralateral activity. The, it's a, the a hypothesis that after the Q, he starts to accumulate either to one side or to the other, if it's R or L, while the raw activity, the, the redness potential, will in increase, also increase during this time. And if the target comes in the beginning, in the middle, or in the end, it will encounter different levels of, of lateralization. And if the, the lateralization is already is too big, then it, it, it will be harder to change the decision of the subject. So the subliminal influence of the target will be smaller. The sensitivity will be smaller. On the other hand, in the unbiased condition, it will be, since there is no lateralization, it should be more uniform and for sure bigger than the biased condition. And that's what we found. So if we look in the left upper part, um, we can see the sensitivity or the D prime for the subliminal condition in the bias, that's the red and the unbiased condition, and the difference is significant between the two. So here I'm bringing all the ISM. While in the visibility test, they are completely at chance for the unbiased condition and marginally above chance around 0.25 for the bias. So it's not completely subliminal, but it's really small. While in the supraliminal, there is no significant difference between bias and bias, neither in the, the visibility. But they are pretty much at ceiling here. It's really easy to see the, the queue without the, the, the target without the mask. So we did a further analysis and we split this, the in three beans, so we've been at the, the sensitivity in three, around 300, 800, and 1300 milliseconds. And, and an alpha showed that there is a significant interaction between the beans and the bias condition, which is not the case for the superliminal. Again, because I think they are at ceiling. So this allows us to make a post hoc analysis between the first and, and, and the last. Uh, beans, and we can see that the unbiased condition is significantly smaller in the end, while the biased condition is pretty much con constant. So it was not exactly what we predicted, but uh, still the, the unbiased is it's, it's bigger. So it's like they're lateralizing already in the beginning. So now I'm going to show some preliminary EEG results. Uh, here I'm showing the LRPs for the three beans that I just showed, so three, around 300, 800, and 1300. And you can see that it is more pronounced in the beginning and it decreases in the unbiased condition. So in the last bean, you almost, these things, uh, the bars are cluster permutation significance, so the LRP significance only for the first and the second bean, and it's not present for the third, seems to be correlated with the change in sensitivity which is not the case for the bias condition where the LRP is always significant. But we didn't know if this is, if, if it was the cause or the, the consequence of the change in sensitivity, right? So we took the, the lateralization 20 milliseconds before the target appeared. We took the lateralization and the raw increase in activity just before the target appeared. And we tried to correlate that with the prime. And we found what we found is that, is that the lateralization, the contralateral difference, is not correlated with the D prime, but the redness potential or the raw increase in activity is highly correlated. And unfortunately, it's not. Uh, we cannot see an interaction between bias and unbiased. So now I'm going to the conclusions, and I think. One of the main conclusions is that 
the lateralization appears to start really early and sustain it over time. And this would explain the difference between the raw difference between bias and unbiased condition, why they are in fact worse for bias condition than unbiased. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it seems that the preparation starts early but decreases over time. Or it increases and has a negative correlation with the sensitivity because the longer the ICI, the smaller the sensitivity and also the the smaller the sensitivity, the smaller the raw increase in activity. Uh, I guess I'm a bit early. Yeah, thank you. And there is work showing that the raw activation, like the PMD, is related to attention. So perhaps this is one of the, the reasons that the subjects, they saw a bit more in the bias condition, right? So it's in this study, I don't think we can really uh, do anything with it too, but in the neutral condition, the subject is expecting something. He doesn't know what, if it's left or right. So in this sense, he, his attention is decreased, like he knows it's coming, but he doesn't know if it's left or right. So he has no expectation, perceptual expectation about the, the target. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. I was uh, wondering about the conditions here, actually, biased and unbiased. Do yeah. I understand correctly that biased is both um, a valid and an invalid? No, it's R, Q, right, and left. Yeah. So it's the average prime for Q, right, and left. And unbiased, it's the Q in neutral alone. Yes, and, but the, the, and the right and left, it can be both congruent and incongruent with the target, right? Yes, Did exactly. Did you look at congruent versus incongruent? Or am I not understanding it? Correctly? Yeah, so... We, if we take the signal as left, for instance, and we calculate the D prime for when the Q is left, and then we do the same for when the Q is right, and we sum them both. So if they are answering purely for the Q, it will, would be zero. Okay, I, th I, th I think I had thought that there were also cases where the, the Q was right, but then the target was actually left, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, it happens. Oh. Yeah, so yeah, so the, the right Q predicts the target 75% to the right. So we have 25% of the trials that target to the left. But if for the Q, when the Q is right, if you calculate the D prime, say the signal is left, right? So if the subject is all the time answering right, right? And always gets me, but the, in the end, if you take the congruent and incongruent trials separately and you calculate the D prime when you sum, if the subject's always answering with respect to the Q, it goes to zero, right? If the guy is always saying left, your signal is left. If you do the D prime for congruent and incongruent trials separately, and then do the average, and then you sum them up, it should go to zero. Okay. Yeah, I, was, uh, I was mostly triggered, I think, by the fact that there seems to be a difference in visibility for biased versus unbiased? It yes. Seems like it's a bit of a, and I was wondering if there's more visibility when the when the queue is congruent with the target or I incongruent. Or, so I was wondering if, they, if we'd split those conditions up. Or yeah, but we, we did, so you're right, we, we did calculate the D prime separated for congruent and incongruent. So the incongruent only has a bigger variance than the congruent. But hmm? the incongruent has a bigger variance because you have less trials in the incongruent. But if you calculate using left a signal congruent and incongruent, so the subject for the left Q is always answering left, 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 you're going to have uh, 75 and 25 
and should go to zero. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but you can talk about that uh, afterwards. Turns not automatically after 15 minutes. Yeah, it's green. Yeah, it goes green. Ah, okay.